we believe that this message will be a blessing to you so I want you to stay glued and watch to the end and share to bless others this is Christocentric we have a lot of Apostle Eric Nyamiche's message on our platform kindly check them out thank you for watching stay blessed this morning I shall share some thoughts on building the church of God I think that this generation is missing it and the earlier we reposition the church the better so we can have maximum impact in our world and on our society so I'll be discussing about building the church of God building the church of God I shall be pressing home the fact that we need to build the church to be strong we need to build the church to last and we need to build the church to spread building the church of God we need to build the church to be strong the church ought to be built to last the church ought to be built to spread I will divide the message into three parts building to be strong building the check to last and building the check to spread I shall deal with the first two parts so I will talk about building the check to be strong and then building the check to last and then a week today I will deal with the last part uh, when I visit Sydney and so from Sydney you also hook on to complete this series on building the church of God building the church of God now when we are talking about church then we are talking about Jesus Christ the gift of God who came down and saved humanity Jesus did not just come to save individual sinners he hinted that he will build this church and that the church will have an opposition in the devil and so the church that he intended to build was not a weak church because he hinted that the church will have an opposition in the devil himself but its gates will not be able to withstand the onslaughts of the church so the church is powerful enough even to conquer the devil himself that is how powerful his intention of establishing the church was and in fact the church should be built to be very strong the new community of Christians called the church was to continue from where Jesus left off now so the church is to continue from where Jesus left off for that reason for it to be very effective he commissioned the disciples to wait for the promise Holy Spirit for power so that the church will be able to march on without any hindrance from or without being stopped by the gates of hell so Pentecost was to help the church to effectively partner with Christ to establish the kingdom of God on earth beginning from Jerusalem to Samaria and to the ends of the earth so all of us as co-workers with the Lord he gave us the promised Holy Spirit to partner us so we can establish the church we can build the church so anytime that we talk about the Holy Spirit we must remember that we are building something and that we are building the church of God but we need to build it to last we need to build it to be strong and we need to build a church to spread what then is the church what then is the church that we seek to build i would define the church as this a community of holy people walking in love and advancing onto the world with the gospel of salvation a community of holy people i'm not saying perfect people but a community of holy people washed by the blood once you are washed by the blood before god you are made holy you are a saint walking in love and advancing onto the world with the gospel of salvation for me this is how i would define the church so when we say we are building the church you must have in mind the holy people 
you must have a, a fellowship of love and you must have a people who have a purpose of advancing onto the world with the gospel of salvation. So the church should not be locked up in a room because it has a mandate to perform. Any church that is locked up in a room is not the kind of church that Jesus envisaged to build. The church is a community of holy people walking in love and advancing onto the world with the gospel of salvation, which is the power of God that saves. The power of God that saves. So we need to be careful how we build. We shouldn't just be checking. We must watch side that we'll be able to hit the target for which God called us and for which the Holy Spirit was given to us. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 3, Tobiah, the Ammonite, said something. Now, his intention was to just ridicule Nehemiah and to weaken their hands and stop them effectively from building the walls. So he says something that I want us to uh, maybe ponder over. He is an enemy so far as the building of the wall is concerned. And I've not heard anybody preach any good thing about Sambala, Tobias, and Geshem. But I want us to pay attention to what Tobias said. Sometimes you may have an enemy, but listening to your enemy, your enemy can be a good help to you. Don't always think that your enemy wants you into the grave, no. Sometimes you pay attention to the enemy. So let's listen to what Tobiah is saying. Nehemiah 4 verse 3. Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, now let's listen to what he said. What they are building, even a fox climbing up on it would break down their walls of stone. What they are building, even a fox Climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. Now, this is Toba, ridicule, Nehemiah and the builders. What they are building, even a fox climbing on it would break down their wall of stone. Even though this was a statement meant to ridicule and discourage the builders of the wall, there is an eternal truth embedded in his statement. What he is trying to say is this. We have to be concerned about the structural integrity of what we build. We have to be concerned about the structural integrity of what we build so that a fox wouldn't jump on it and break the wall. So when you are building, remember what Tobiah said and make sure that the structural integrity of what we are building is solid. So when you are talking about building a church, we also ought to be concerned so that we build a church that is strong, a church that will last, and a church that will spread. We need to build a church to be strong and powerful. So I will discuss building the church to be strong and powerful. Shall we turn our Bibles to Matthew 16? We read from verse 18 and 19. Matthew 16. 18 and 19. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. And the gaze of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, this is quite controversial, especially when we want to relate to the fact that Peter was the one that Jesus was referring to as the rock. 
So I will take it again, especially verse 18. And, I'll, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So by the revelation Peter gave, Jesus said, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not be able to withstand it. Now, when you go to 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 32, 2 Samuel 22, 32, this is what the scripture says. Who is God beside the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? Now, when we talk about the rock, you are talking about our God. The English Standard Version says that, and who is a rock except our God? So when we are talking about rock, the dependable, we are talking about God, not Peter. In fact, Second Corinthians says that there was a rock that was behind Israelite, a spiritual rock, which the people drank from. And then said that rock was Christ. So it is settled that the rock is Christ. There is no other rock. He is the foundation of the church. And upon that foundation, he will build his church. So the foundation is laid. And the Apostle Paul is telling all of us that whoever builds on the foundation should be careful how he builds. Because God has an intention for building his church. He has the master plan. When it is revealed to us, we need to build it according to plan. And so we need to build a church to be powerful and strong. The church should be strong and powerful so it will be able to answer questions. The church should be built to answer questions so that the world will know that Jesus is the answer for the world today. The church should be built to be able to meet needs, physical needs, spiritual needs, emotional needs. The church should be able to be built to be strong enough to meet needs. The church should be able to be strong and powerful enough to be able to solve problems, daunting tasks. What the doctors have given up on, the church should be able to bring solution to it. What the nation is struggling to manage, the church should be able to bring solution to it. So we are not just churching, we are building the church to be able to answer questions, solve problems, and meet needs. We should be able to build a church to answer questions, solve problems, and meet needs. In Obadiah chapter 1, verse 17, this is what the scripture says. Obadiah 1, 17. But on Mount Zion, here Mount Zion is a reference to the church of God, will be deliverance. But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. So in the church, there must be liberation. People should come here with baggages and God should be able to liberate them. People should come here with, with challenges and the church should be able to meet the needs, solve the problem and answer questions. So on Mount Zion, there must be deliverance. It will be holy. It shouldn't be a place where people come sinners and they remain sinners. They come as sinners. They accept Jesus as Lord. And by the washing of the word, the people should be sanctified and set free. So they will be able to go out there and be a blessing to other people. So we see the church as a clinic. But when people get here, they should be healed. They, when people come here, they should be healed. Verse 21 of Obadiah chapter 1 says this. Deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountain of Esau and the kingdom will be the Lord's. Now we want to combine the two. Verse 17 is saying that but on Mount Zion in the church there will be deliverance. And then 21 is saying that deliverers, that is to say those who have been delivered on Mount Zion will now be known as deliverers. They will go up from Mount Zion, the church, to govern the mountain of Esau. That is the world. 
and the kingdom will be the loss now. So when we come to church, that we should be able to be transformed here in church so that with the transformation we receive from church, we'll go out there into our spheres and transform our world so that the kingdoms will become the kingdom of our God. So the church is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. It's a channel by which God who wants to enter into nations. So Christ in you, the Bible says that you are the hope of the manifestation of the glory of God. So we don't just come to church. We come to church to receive, to be transformed. So we go out there and transform our spheres. We go out there to transform our spheres. The church must receive sinners and transform them into saints. The church should be an equipping center where people are well principled to impart society with values and principles of the kingdom of God. The church's ministry should not be ordinary, no. God must be in her midst. When we come to church and church is ordinary, then the Lord is not in our midst. The church should not be ordinary. It must be built to be strong. There must be the supernatural. The giftings you operate. The church must not be ordinary. We should see that God is with us. Even the world should know that God is with them. The church should not be ordinary at all. Now the church must be a reference of anything good and beautiful. The church must be a reference of anything good and beautiful. So let us open our eyes to see whether the world sees that the church is beautiful. Whether the world is looking at us and praising us that we can be a reference to anything good. It should, by the lifestyle of her members, prove to the watching world that indeed, God sent Jesus to save sinners so that they will be attracted to Jesus, the desire of the nations. Now, all of us come to church, but I'm saying that there is a watching world. They are looking at us and what they see of us exhibiting, it will either prove to them that Jesus came to save sinners, or God sent Jesus, or otherwise. So, we don't just have to come here. We must know that the watching world is looking at us. And by our lifestyle, they should be able to say that of a truth, God sent Jesus because of a transformed life, because of my transformed life and your transformed life. We need to build a church to be strong and powerful. Now, this message is not just for a few, maybe for the clergy. I want all of us to know that we are part of the building of the church and that we should all make sure that we build this church to be powerful and strong. I said to be able to do three things. Three things. It should be able to be strong and powerful to do three things. Who can give me one? Two. We have to build a church now. We have to build a church to be strong. We have to build a church to last. And we need to build a church to spread. But I'm saying that we need to build a church to be powerful. Why? So, it should be able to do three things. That powerful church should be able to do three things. One, yes. Should be able to answer questions. Number two, solve problems. Number three, meet needs. We went to church one day. We had a prayer meeting somewhere. We have prayed, we have fasted. And we are expecting the hand of God to be revealed in the meeting. I came to church quite early, as usual. 
We started a prayer meeting around 5.30 p.m. GMT. Then I saw this lady who kept going out and coming in. But any time that he came in, she behaved a bit funny. She would hold one ear and then she would be turning the head like that. We were not many in the church, so I could see her and what she was doing. I was wondering what was the problem. Then she would go out and come back again. And this time she would touch the other ear. And then would be opening the mouth. I knew her to be a nurse. So I was wondering what she was doing. She wasn't a lunatic, but she was behaving as one. So I was wondering what was going on. Then soon the place was flooded. Then we, after the prayer meeting, we gave opportunity for people to testify as to what God has done for them. Then this lady picked the mic. So I was interested in listening to what she was going to say. Not knowing that the right ear was not able to hear. She was deaf in the right ear. And somehow, when we started the church, she felt a pop in the right ear. And now she could, she could hear. And she was so amazed that, that it, she would go out and then try to figure out if she, was, she could still hear from both ears. Now she was hearing. So she would come inside, try and close the right one, and then, of course, this one will hear. Then try and close the left one. And this time, she realized that the, the right was hearing. That was how she was behaving. And I thought she was, she was getting out of their mind. You see, God is a miracle-working God. If the church, now listen, what is going out there, going on, and all the challenges in the world, if the church remains ordinary, we cannot combat what is going out there. There must be real revelation in the church. The church must be built to be strong. Really strong. So that there is a sharp dichotomy between what goes on in the world and what goes on in the church. The people in the world must know and see and feel that the church is different. And that God is in her midst. Number two, we need to build a church to last. We need to build a church to last. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9 reads, 1 Corinthians 3 9, For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I lay a foundation as a wise builder. And someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. Should be careful how he builds. That is why we are talking about the fact that we can't just be churching. We must lift up our eyes and watch and see and examine whether what we are building meets the specification that God has set for us. We all of us must be careful how we build. We should be mindful of the quality of material and the structural integrity of what we are building. Because we are always building against the rains, against the storms, against the bad weather. By all means, there will be flood. I'm not talking about physical structure, but I'm talking about spiritual flood and tough times that the church will have to face. The gates of Hades is waiting for us. So we need to build a church to be strong. And we need to build it to last. We need to build it to last. How do we build a church to last? Now, leaders of churches need to be careful how we build a church. For we are not building for our own self-aggrandizement. That is expansion of power and of wealth. I'm sure that even amongst the Ghanaian community, there are a lot of churches. And sometimes you don't even know which one to go. In Africa today, there are a lot of churches. 
Every 10 meters, there's a church. Yet, the continent is the same. Nothing is changing. And so we must examine what kind of church and what is moving us to build churches. And some has been transported. We have exported some of our churches abroad. I'm sure you have received a lot of them here. But what kind of churches are we building? Are we building for our own self-aggrandizement or we are building for the glory of God? We need to build a church for the glory of God. And we need to build a church for the succeeding generation. That is why I'm saying that we need to build a church to last. We need to build a church to last. Leadership is about tomorrow. Why should leaders be mindful of tomorrow? Why do we have to build tomorrow's church today? Because what we are doing today is always against tomorrow. What we are enjoying today is what our forebears or our leaders of yesteryear actually did. That is the church we are enjoying. Then when we take the reins of leadership, the leaders of today must also build tomorrow's church today. And so we need to build this church to last so that the succeeding generation will enjoy a better church than we have even enjoyed. Are we together? Fine. Why should leaders think about tomorrow? Number one, human beings aspire. We don't live forever. So because we aspire and leaders will not be there forever, every good leader should think about tomorrow. Two, there is a limit as to what people can do. We always cannot do it all. So when you have the space and you are building a church, because you are limited, Think about the tomorrow's church so that you'll be able to carry the people here into tomorrow. Number three, we live in certain time and space. You, none of us will live forever. But there is a generation coming after us. Don't say that it's all about what I will eat and wear today. Let's think about those who are coming after us. So we'll be able to build a church that will last. Some churches die when their leaders die. No. Church should live beyond the leader's time or the founder's time. Number four. No generation possibly finishes the work of God because every day a sinner is born onto the planet Earth. Now, if this work is about saving souls and bringing sinners unto God, then no generation of ministers will be able to finish the work of God. Because I'm saying that every day, a fresh sinner is born on Earth. So we need to think about tomorrow. Then the fifth and the last one, that I have on my card is this. Every generation comes with its own challenges. And it takes the people of that same generation to deal with the challenges of the generation. So when we are building the church today, we must think of the church tomorrow and consciously carry the young people along. Because we will get to a certain generation where the challenges will be over and above me because I don't belong to that category of people. It will take the young people to deal with the challenges of the day. So when we come to church every day, and it's all about what the old men can do, it's all about old men leading us, it's all about the aged preaching, then we are not thinking about tomorrow's church. No, no. We are not thinking about tomorrow's church. God's instruction to Joshua to possess the nations or to take the land. That kind of instruction to go and battle and take over the land was not for the aged. 
Because so far as battle is concerned, it is for the young. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. Deuteronomy 6, verse 1. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So, okay, Deuteronomy, just take just the verse 1. Now, Deuteronomy 6, 1. Now, these are the commands, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land whether ye go to. So, don't be using this version. When we come to a public ministry like this, because whether ye, we, we don't say whether ye again in, in, in the contemporary world. So, let's look for uh, the newer versions, if you can. So, so for, you take steps to bring newer versions. So, let's read the NIV. These are the commands, decrees, and laws that the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land you are crossing the Jordan to what? To possess. Now, the, the land across the Jordan was inhabited by people. So when he said go and possess, it meant go and really do battle and take over. Now that kind of instruction was not for the aged. It was for the young. Let's go to chapter 7 verse 1. Chapter 7 verse 1. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess. You are entering the land to what? To possess. And drives out before you many nations. Then he lists the nations. So Joshua was going to lead an army to do battle. Chapter 8, verse 1. Be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today, so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. So we are talking about land being possessed. And I'm saying that it is not something that it is for the aged. Chapter 9, Deuteronomy chapter 9. This time I'll read verse 1, 2, 3. Here, Israel, you are, you are about to cross Jordan to go in and dispossess nations greater, stronger than you, with large cities that have walls up to the skies. And so if they are going to dispossess nations stronger and larger, with high walls up to the skies, then Joshua actually was supposed to be somebody who, who is strong or strong to be able to do that battle. So the possessing of the nation's agenda, it is not for the aged. Now, when Joshua died, he died with the people of his generation. If you read Joshua 24, from verse 29 to 33, you realize that he died with the people of his generation. Why am I saying this? Let me read Joshua 24 from 29. After these things, Joshua son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. So he was 110 years when he died. Israel saved the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who had lived him. That is Joshua. So Joshua died, but some of his contemporaries had lived him. And Israel was still serving the Lord. And the elders who had lived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. Verse 33 says that, And Eliezer, son of Aaron, died and was buried in Gibeah which had been allotted to his son Phinehas in the hill country of Ephraim. Now, when you are talking about Joshua, you can say that Moses' aid, his boy, so to speak, was Joshua. Now, Moses' big brother was Aaron. And we are hearing that Aaron's son, who should be a contemporary of Joshua, is also dead. Did you hear Eliezer dying? And so... We die in generations. Now, when you grow, you are about 70, 75. 
and you hear that your friends are dying, know that soon you also die. Now we are dying in generations. That is the normal thing that happens. All things being equal. If we like, when we are around 70 years or 72, try and then find out where your primary school... Uh, <laughs> now, try and find out. You'll be shocked with surprise. You'll be sorry you started calling. So where is Joseph Mensah? Oh, gone. Where is... Oh, it, oh so t- 10 years ago. Where is that one? Oh, just yesterday. When is that one? So we die in generation. After a while, a whole generation will be collected. That is how life is. So we always have to build a church. Being mindful of the next generation. So the church must carry the youth and the children along. We must always carry them along. They are our strength, our hope, and our future. The church must carry the young people along. Now, God knew this. So, he wanted Israel to avoid this kind of situation. Because in Judges chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible reads that after Joshua and his generation have been collected to glory, there came another generation who did not know the Lord. So, they vie away from the status of God. They never served God. That should not have happened. The baton should have been effectively handed over to the children because they needed to build to last. But there was a break and these young ones never knew the Lord. That is why some churches in some nations which used to be Christian nations are dead. The young people have grown up in pagan ignorance of God because the baton was not handed over to them. Let it not happen to the church of Pentecost. We need to build this church to last. Read Psalm 78 from 1 to 8. Psalm 78, 1 to 8. But let's come into the New Testament. And we'll read Acts chapter 21, verse 5. Acts 21, verse 5. When it was time to leave, we left and continued on our way. All of them, including wives and and children, till we were out of the city and we, we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. So let's interact with this scripture. Shall we have it again? And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way. And they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. Did the children also pray? Were they part of those who knelt down? Yes. if we say they are part of those who nail them, then let me just try and conclude with building the church to last. The youngsters are involved and they must be properly and intentionally brought in the activities of the church. Because we are building this church to last. So we must be mindful of tomorrow. They can be reading scriptures when we come to church. They can be leading worship as we saw done. They can be part of the choir. They can be reciting. They can be preaching. Everything that they need to do, let's get them on board. Young people are always our challenge. Because youthful life is quite challenging. They are challenging to every society. So they are also challenging to the church. But we don't give up on them. When we are able to handle them well, they become asset against the future. So we need to build this church to last. And we need to carefully do that. Now, in some churches, where they have auditoriums and places where young people, children in particular, can go for, 
for service. They just come to church and they ask the children to go out there and do their own church. Now, as you do that, you are effectively separating the children from the main church. They will grow up and you expect them to come here and they don't desire to come. Now, when we come to church, let's begin service with them. Let's do the worship with them. Let them also enjoy our praises. At least learn how to sing our songs. Then, when it's time for the preaching of the word, separate them. They can then go to their teachers, let them be taught whatever they need to be taught, and let them close and come and join us for all of us to close. Now, when you are doing that, you are showing them that this is where you belong. And so, when it's time for them to be here, they don't drag to be here. We need to build the church to last. And if we have to build the church to last, we need to be mindful of tomorrow's church. Now, where is Apostle Ander? Please come. And then come with Elder. Elder has been a blessing. Yeah. The two of them. Are founding members of this church. I'm not going to ask any of them how old yeah, you are. Yeah. But we are building the church against tomorrow. So this is where we are going. They started a church. When you started, how old were you? Not. You see, he's an old man. He has even forgotten the, the <laughs> around. I was around 30, 32. 32, 39. You have done a lot. But we can't carry them into the future. No. We can't. If you are going to carry them into the future, there are certain things that they will never be able to do. And the young people will not continue to follow them. That is why we retire people. Yeah. You need to retire them so you'll be able to carry the young people into the future. Have I communicated? Yeah. Please sit down. Or you, want, you still want to go 10 years more? <laughs> yeah, please sit down. That is why we retire people. Because we need to carry the young people along. So when you come to church and the youngsters come, receive them just as they are. And train them to be able to become like Jesus. I'm not saying that when they come in any kind of color. I'm saying receive them. But put the Jesus color on them. And then carry them along into the future. Because the future is theirs. We need to build this church to last. There was this elder that I met some time ago, he presided me. He was my presiding advisor, so you can imagine. When I met him, he was with his pastor. And then he said to me that I should impress upon the pastor so that the pastor will review him from the presiding eldership. Uh, he said for, for too long, consistently, He's been a presiding elder for 25 consecutive years like that. He's never been reviewed. And so, I was wondering why that happened. It shouldn't have happened. And I remembered what happened some years ago. Some young men were dancing in church. Those days, the reggae music has just been introduced into the church. And the elderly folks were not too comfortable because reggae was Bob Marley. And the young men, when they, they, they love to jump to the same tune. And so reggae music was being played in the church. And then these young men just took to the floor and they started jumping. But the pastor 
couldn't read the temperature well. He just took his bell. Those days, we had a big bell. And whilst the young men were still in their tracks dancing, he rang the bell, he shouted on them, he embarrassed them, and asked them to go and sit down. Eleven of them. I was far away in my first station, and I heard this. So I quickly came down to look for them, because they had all left the church. See, what young people do not like is embarrassment. They can't take that one. So, because of the embarrassment, out of anger, their leader let them out. And you must always look for their leader. They have leaders. You have presiding elders. They also have their leaders. Look, look for them. And then make sure that you are always with the leader. Bring the leader in. They will follow the leader. They left the church. So, I decided to go and then look for them. But it was just too late. I managed to bring just a few. See, those young men were supposed to have taken over from this presiding elder. If they were still around, he wouldn't have served for that long. But because these ones left, there was a gap. And so we need to build this church to be very strong. We also need to build it to last. And then, the most interesting one is that we need to build this church to spread. But I'll leave that for next week. Let me take this last quotation. E. Pinto said, and I quote, can we read together, ready, go. The society that hates its youth has no future. Any society that hates its young people has no future. I pray that the Lord will help us so that we will be able to reorganize our thoughts and our hearts as we intend to build this church to be strong. And we want to build this church to also last. And we want to build it to spread. God bless all of us.